Peter Rice was a genius structure engineer, but he was more than that. And I think there is no frontier between an engineer and an artistic creator, a poet. An Engineer Imagines is a fascinating documentary by Marcus Robinson on the work of Peter Rice. I should declare an interest at the start in that Peter Rice is a distant relative of mine and I'm also an engineer as well, both of which made the documentary all the more fascinating to me. While overlooked for many decades, two documentaries on Peter Rice have been released almost coincidentally, one featuring the Dublin International Film Festival. It says something about us Irish that we neglect our heroes and, uh, and prominent people for some time and then probably overcompensate later. And there is a tendency perhaps to compete rather than collaborate when it comes to these projects. In the genre of documentary, many directors find themselves perhaps restricted to a fairly rigid structure as a documentary is based on a factual experiences. Marcus Robinson does an excellent job here. And he bookends the documentary with the Full Moon Theatre in France, which is a very romantic and beautiful setting where Peter Rice was involved. And it shows his that he wasn't just an international businessman churning out contracts, which he certainly was excellent. at. He was also an artistic dreamer in that he did get involved with this passion project of his friend who was based in a very remote region of France and had this dream to light a theatre on the full moon using only the natural light of the moon itself. So that is a beautiful bookend to this film. The use of spectacular time lapses throughout the film is very impressive. In the Q&A afterwards, the director clarified the need for this in that it, practically every scene was a time lapse at one point, which is very exhausting and although beautiful. But Marcus Robinson, the director in the Q&A explained that he wanted to show two things. First of all, the interaction of the people with the buildings over 12 hour periods throughout the day and also the interaction of light as it traveled as the sun traveled throughout the sky and the building itself so the time lapse was a genius device in that regard peter rice went so when brian and, and friends had called me i was just overjoyed to to find out about him and i think the the most inspiring thing i learned about him and hopefully that comes through in the film is his the spirit of not being not being an, e an ego driven person and working in a very um, uh, consensual and shared way with his the, the people he worked with on his different teams. One of the most impressive aspects of Rice's attitude towards his work is his rebellious nature. Inventive, playful, topsy turvy logic that actually turns out to be brilliant. And his willingness to rip up the rule book from the very start and to create structures which, on first glance, should not stand up, but somehow do. And there's a certain amount of magic in, in that, and the references there that he, he for him, architecture and, and engineering was a performance art. It was an interaction between the people and the building. And that rebellious nature and his ability to to change things is certainly, it's probably my favourite aspect of that is in the George Pompidou building, where the guts of the structure and the workings of the building, which normally are hidden away underneath um, false floors and false walls, are brought right out to the front. So the internal organs and the skeleton of the building are exposed at the front and the guts and the workings, of the, the, the lungs and the breathing, the air, the plumbing and the water, everything is exposed in the front of the building. And that was a very brave move, very controversial at the time. And it said in Paris that the George Pompidou building was love at second sight because many of the Parisians absolutely loathed the building. And still do, many do to this day. Of course, also they loaded the Eiffel Tower when it arrived first. Um, they called it a phallic structure and Alec Eiffel himself was banished to a little room at the top of the uh, Eiffel yeah, Tower. One so. fascinating aspect of the George Pompidou Rosano piano talks about the context of the time. In 1968, you had the Parisian riots and just three years later, they were building the Pompidou Centre. So the rebellious nature of the architecture of the Pompidou resonated with the with the period of the time. We were all boys, practically. 
Big boys. Another fascinating project that's covered in the film is uh, another one of Rice's buildings, which was the Lloyds of London building, which is now a grade one listed historical monument. What was fascinating about that is Lloyds was noted as one of the most conservative companies at the time, centuries old banking institution, if you like. And yet, Rice opted for one of the most radical buildings in the UK at the time. And it's it was mentioned in the film that what he wanted was a modern idiom to reflect the piratical nature of the financial traders who were taking to the high seas like pirates out to conquer new territories, new financial aspects and new territories and derivatives and so on. In the modern context, looking back at the financial crash, the romantic nature of that could be disputed one way or the other, but it's certainly true that he did capture a very futuristic and bold and brave attitude towards that building, which would have been anticipated to take the form of a very austere building, but what Rice delivered was the complete opposite. My favourite buildings throughout the film that Peter Rice was involved in are all based in France and quite often Paris, which led me to think that it would be possible and very enjoyable to do a, a tour of of Paris just purely on Peter Rice's buildings alone. And one of the most back, back, spectacular of which is the Louvre glass pyramid, an absolutely beautiful structure, the inverted pyramid of the Louvre, which featured, inspired the Da Vinci Code and all of that mystery around it and that ancient sort of uh, conspiracy theories and mystery, which is not surprising considering how beautiful a structure it is. And using Peter Rice's ma- magic, it, again, it was another structure which appeared, shouldn't appear to, to stand up and be supported. However, due to his rebellious and ingenious structural engineering, certainly does to this day. There are some fascinating personal insights to to Rice as well. And here's where the family footage really comes into its own. And that certainly adds a very romantic aspect to the film and sometimes very poignant and sad moments looking back on a man who died all too young at the age of 52. They'd said that Peter Rice couldn't read at the age of nine and that he decided to think instead, which is a fascinating insight into perhaps the nature and origin of some of his genius ideas. It's so emotionally engaging for us, particularly his family, because obviously it does actually reveal to us some things about his career that we weren't aware of. But also what's really interesting to me is a lot of the testimony of people that he knew and worked with is, is similar in their experiences to the experiences we had as his children because he was so, he was very much a kind of, uh, he, was, he was not a, he, he, as a father he was very, uh, you know, focused on us as his kids. We didn't, he didn't bring his work home a lot. It said he had a problem with bureaucracy and about the tendency to whip out the rule book and he was determined to rip up that rule book from, from the very word go. And it's also said that he said yes easily, which uh, it says in the film was unusual for an engineer. And that's probably true. I can vouch for that. A particularly poignant moment of the film is when Rice falls sick at the all too early age of 50. And he delves into a fairly spiritual area of his life. And he turns his work then towards more spiritual projects and the most fascinating of which is the redesign of the facade of a French cathedral. The sheer genius and breadth of ability of Peter Rice can't be underestimated, however, and it's very evident from the film. I mean, one of which is a reference from writing a computer program in 1961 in order to model the correct dimensions of, of the roof of Sydney Opera House. And I can just imagine back in 1961, that computer in which he wrote that must have been probably filled a room the size of Sydney Opera House at the time. So that was an impressive fact amongst many impressive facts about Rice throughout the film. I think Peter Rice was like a magician. He had tricks. Another fascinating insight into his approach to his work was that he had a principle not to draw too early to talk it out and to debate it first. And that's a fascinating insight into his nature of how he designed and took the approach to the project. There are talks of anecdotes of 
him bringing five or six of his colleagues back to the house and they would talk and row into the night about the nature of buildings. It, it was said in the in the film also, the arrow doesn't hit the target, the target comes to the arrow. Another insight into perhaps the sort of collaborative and re- recursive nature of how he planned projects. It was said he was a very keen team player and there was a fascinating overlap of roles. A lot of what he did as an engineer probably wouldn't be possible in today's world in the very regimented demarcation of roles in engineering and architecture today. The documentary might spray into the area of hagiography in some parts, particularly perhaps when Rice is compared to Rice's attitude towards structural engineering is compared to Joyce in literature, which I'm sure Rice himself might find a little bit far fetched. And I'd imagine Rice would probably identify more with the poetry of Kavanaugh, who was a, a fellow countryman of himself and in his keen perhaps more than Joyce himself. One of the fascinating aspects was Rice absolutely loved problems. He was a passionate problem solver. And in some ways you wonder, did he go out of his way to create problems in his building so that he would have problems to solve himself? Either way, the result is spectacular. And it's hard not to think that this spectacular, world-renowned engineer is probably underestimated and under-recognised in his own country which is perhaps sadly always the case. But this film certainly goes some way towards readdressing that and towards showcasing the rebellious, ingenious and passionate approach of this superb engineer to his work. A work of which is, by its nature, completely free and open for all to visit. And you know, gradually people come to you to buy surprise. And the thing that's nicest about it is that when people come to buy surprise, I have no idea what I'm going to give them either.